I was invited because the organizers of this event thought that since I most recently took part in Deutsche Wohnen Co. and Eichmann's foreigner working group right to the city, and since I previously took part in an, in in an initiative called Solidarity City Berlin, that I might have something smart and meaningful to say about migrants and suffrage. After all, both initiatives called into question the place of migrants um, and demanded that the borders that confine suffrage be abolished so that scores of ordinary people who currently experience history on the sidelines can step into the field and help steer the ball in a direction better than this place right here. That said, I do not want to begin this discussion from the perspective of the letter of the law. Doing that would put the law on a pedestal and would make it seem that laws are to be served by society and not the other way around. Instead, I wanna begin our approach to the question of expanding political participation to the lens afforded by a far more fundamental crisis of care that is experienced by social groups not limited to migrants. Everywhere I look, everywhere I go, I am confronted by this overwhelming incapacity of ordinary people to be able to change the world around them. Take this keynote as an example. It was prepared in night shifts and lunch breaks with a toddler in daycare and uh, uh, with a toddler to take care of during the day and a daycare facility that has no resources left due to a pandemic. Um, uh, this is clearly part of the problem. Hence, by ordinary people, I mean teachers, daycare instructors, school kids, university students, doctors, scientists, garbage collectors, flight attendants, food couriers, programmers, janitors, mail carri carriers, engineers, nurses, radiologists, even lawyers. All kinds of people are experiencing this tremendous crisis of care as they are not able to care as they would like to as my dear friend and feminist researcher, Manuela uh, Zechner puts it. And what do I mean by that? It means being able to care for themselves, their loved ones, or their communities by being able to afford healthy food, being able to pay the heating and pay the rent, getting a bed at the hospital, let alone a nurse to take care of them, having childcare that feels good to drop your children off at or elderly care you feel good leaving your parents at and being able to have the time to enjoy a life that is all the more precarious and fleeting. It also means being able to care about problems in ways that actually feel empowering and transformative, not superficial and defeating. Nothing speaks to this greater than the planetary crisis provoked by ecological collapse. Rather than democratic protagonists, in my everyday life, I mostly encounter unwilling hostages who experience a daily calamity brought on by an immovable process that they cannot shrug, a direction that if left unchanged will lead to our collective doom. Once again, to follow the insights of my friend and comrade Manuela, to care as we would like to then is immediately related to the problem of power. When I talk about the problem of expanded suffrage then, I want us to begin from this actual context, from this crisis of care and the problem of power that is broadly shared by most people rather than an abstract legalism that functions only to reinforce this very impasse. Because it is not that voters in this context from where I am speaking have all the power and we migrants and foreigners have none. And it's definitely not as the right wing would have us believe that voters have no power and migrants have all the power. What my everyday encounter with people around me makes quite clear is that most voters are powerless themselves to determine the direction of change, despite the fact that they vote. What could make this case more clearly than the campaign to expropriate corporate landlords here in Berlin? This is a campaign that won 59% of the vote. This is despite the fact that 25% of tenants, nearly 25% of ordinary people who give their hard earned money to hedge funds that give that money to investors in exchange for the temporary right to house themselves and their loved ones were blocked from having a say in this process because of residency and citizenship status. Even before such a disadvantage, the campaign won more, or even before such a disadvantage, the campaign won more than any party. It took place in a context of political, social, and ecological crisis in which no single party program was able to secure consent. And yet, 
This demand to expropriate and socialize housing secured 59% of the vote. 59% of people understood that this was the best way to lower rent, the best way to keep their communities in place, the best way to have more money to do what they want with the people that they want. It was the best way to have more say in how housing should look like, an intervention in the direction of change. And yet, despite this signal fire cast into the bleak abyss of crisis, we have governmental impasse. We have Mayor Giffey defending the real estate lobby by kicking the can two years down the road in the hope that between now and then the anger will subside and attention will be diverted. DVA has shown that politics is not simply driven by parties and their voters. Over the course of the campaign, players emerged like real estate and financial lobbies players who moved a great deal of wealth and resources, and these players clearly pressure parties as well, sometimes more than voters. If society is going to have any chance at all, it will, hang, it will hinge on the capacity to redistribute power anywhere there's people, as the Black Panther Fred Hampton would have said. We need to build power in the state because, that, because the state has the power over social processes. At least it can. When the right people are in power and when people are ready to flex their power outside the state in the same way capital does uh, when it says it's going to move our money. Huey Newton, a founder of the Black Panther Party, once said that power is the ability to define phenomena and make them act in a desired manner. And this is what I saw in my participation through Deutsche Wohnen und Co. und Eignen. I saw ordinary people define phenomena in common gentrification, racism, financialization, understandings that people said didn't exist 10 years ago and developing a pressure that was forcing it to change. And this wasn't done through the mobilization of money that dictated people do things in exchange for a wage. It was through free democratic association, through self-organization on the time off people had from their work. That referendum result, that incredible, hard won result that was only possible through incredible degrees of organization. I cannot tell you how many meetings, how many embraces, how many fights, how many tears, how many one-on-one -on -one conversations, how many signatures, how many parties, how many burnouts, recoveries, and rallies, how many mic checks, how many speeches written, how many doors knocked, how many minds changed, hearts moved, and stories told that it took to make that happen to introduce that change of discourse and that change in the direction of society's travel. This is where I saw democratic protagonism. This intervention was the pro product of an organ organization of ordinary people over years. And yet so much of that process was also carried by migrants and foreigners. It is important not to underscore any single actor of this incredible process, but instead to understand this as an emergent outcome made possible by the interaction of all its parts. And migrants and foreigners were operating in so many of these parts, increasing the organizational resources the campaign pooled as it expanded the labor power dedicated to the reproduction of the organization, expanded the number of people collecting signatures, putting posters and organizing events, developing entirely novel structures like a cheerleading working group, a working group first conjured in the second signature collection phase of the campaign that came to be an icon of the campaign and a darling of the media and produced incredible life-sustaining cultural productions that were renowned across the Kitsis of Berlin. And yet all of this democracy and movement is in danger in the governmental process since the vote. Why then must we expand the right to vote if voting doesn't seem to do a thing? because the concentration of power in the hands of wealthy elites has only functioned to deteriorate our capacities to reproduce society and for ordinary people to care for their loved ones and communities as they would like to. To stay with the example of the expropriation campaign, if DVA shows the limit of voting, GIFI shows the power of the state apparatus. It is a power that functions in relation to the forces around it. It is not some kind of absolute power, but nevertheless, a mayor like Giffey has access to resource, can regulate markets to a certain degree, and can fight for or against a legislation that allows for expropriation. And at this point, I would like to go back to the question of care, because the state can also allocate resources to schools, child and elderly, and health care. The state can create conditions 
in which we are all able to struggle for our desires. Since the access to this power is regulate, regulated through the process of voting, it obviously matters then who is allowed to vote. But if ordinary people are to stand a chance in a planetary crisis, where capital is unwilling to do anything that denies its monopoly of power, either in the case of the Eneikonen or in the case of the TRIPS waiver, then this monopoly must not be negotiated with, but broken. And this is only possible when ordinary people organize themselves in their communities and at their workplaces in ways that threaten uh, capital's capacity to generate or move money. Indeed, DVA shows that the power of ordinary people to even define what will be on the ballot takes great degrees of organization and unparalleled commitment, sacrifice, and especially joy by ordinary people. We must move away from an understanding of suffrage's expansion that centers the perspective of the law and towards an understanding of suffrage's expansion as part of a broader democratic project aimed at putting power in the hands of ordinary people so that they can care as they would like to in a planetary crisis.